Hello there. Welcome to Birding with Lois. My name is Lois Richter and well, I'm the Lois that goes birding with you. So today we are, we don't have a guest, which is me, and but I do have a partner and this is, this is TJ Asher. And he's been on the show many a time, frequently as crew, and occasionally he comes and talks with me anyway. So we're gonna we're gonna do a little program that we've worked up. I hope it works well. So TJ, what's it about? Hey Lois, uh, thanks for uh, having me on as part of the show instead of the crew today. Um, so uh, I'm a novice birder. You know, I, I find birds interesting, but I'm not really that you know, into birding as such. So how do, you know, if, if I'm kind of interested in birds, I think they're kind of fascinating. How do I get started in birding? What do I do? Okay. So as far as I know, or I think, there's primarily three ways uh, to go birding. So to bird is the verb, by the way. And so the first thing you can do is by sight. That's what most of us do. We are walking along and a bunch of birds fly overhead. Go, oh, what I wonder what those are. Or there's a raptor sitting on top of a pole. We got those. Oh, here we go. A couple of things on the wires. What are those? Uh, I can tell you what all these are because I took these pictures. And then we have things walking on the ground. These are turkeys, by the way. So all of this is, I saw it. And then I was curious about it. And then I figured I'll look it up. All right. So the second way is birding by sound. And that's where you hear something. You hear a crow call and, and you go, oh, I hear that. What is, oh, there it is. Or you hear a scrub jay, they squawk. Or the magpies, they have a different kind of a squawk. Um, or you might hear... Um, a meadow lark sing. If you're in the West, it's one song. If you're in the East, it's a different song, but meadow larks like to sing. And then you might hear something in courting season. This is a red winged blackbird that is serenading the ladies trying to get somebody to come out and stay at his spot. And then there are those birds that are, well, they don't really sing, but this is a woodpecker we have here where I live. I live in California. And a nettles woodpecker. When they're just sitting there, they're silent. But when they go to fly, as soon as they take off, you'll hear this, and off they go. So if you hear that sound and look around and see what's in the air going from one tree to another, that's your nettles woodpecker. This, the third one is what I call birding by expectation. That's where you're in your own neighborhood, you know things. So I go out. In our, our local arboretum at the university, and they have this waterway that goes through it and the paths on both sides. And I'm going, okay, there's water, probably going to look for ducks. And in fact, I do see ducks. I get closer and closer and look, there's some ducks. But don't stop there. Because I know this waterway, I know that along the edges, along the rocks, along the branches overhanging the water, I might see a green heron. Now, if it sees me before I see it, it's going to take off. They're very shy birds, but I could. So I expect to see it. I look for it. The other is as I walk along the path in the wintertime, I know that we have some ground feeding birds, some white crown sparrows and golden crown sparrows and juncos, and they're going to be tucked underneath the bush or just at the edge of the path. And so I'll keep an eye out for them in the distance as I'm walking along. So there I'm expecting what birds to see by knowing something about their habitat and about what these kinds of birds do. Now, you don't have to just do it that way. You can get some guidance. If you go to a place like here, it is a Kilauea Lighthouse, and it's a, a nature area. It's a park. They have lots of signage, and it'll tell you what you're looking for and everything. That's one way to do it. You could get someone to take you on a tour. This was my brother's birthday, so I hired a local naturalist, a friend of mine, to come and lead us on a tour in one of the regional parks around here. You could go on a more formal thing. And this is Curtis Dykstra, who's a naturalist in Michigan. He was on the show. And he is leading in that picture a winter skiing birding trip. But you had to sign up for it. You had to prepare for it, all that sort of stuff. You can even get commercial trips if you want to. And so did that help? 
that did help. So um, you mentioned um, listening to birds and, and uh, so where could I go? You know, how do I, how do I learn about like, what's, what bird sounds like what? You know, I know a crow because um, everybody knows a crow. Oh, crow, yeah. Um, well, actually, you're in luck. You're living now in the modern, you know, 2020s. And so we have more information than we used to have. Now you can go to some place such as download an app called Merlin, which is by the Cornell University. Or there are other bird song apps that you can find where you can put in the name of a bird and it'll tell you what the song what it sounds like. That's been around for a long time. I have that in iBird Pro, which I have had for oh years and years. But now you can record the bird and then ask the computer to see if it can find a song that sounds like that. Pretty miraculous. That is pretty cool. Uh, you know, the future is now and we are living in it. It is pretty <laughs> it is amazing. True. That is true. So you had uh, you'd also mentioned uh, another question, if you don't mind. You had mentioned that um, you were expecting birds to be in a certain place. Mm -hmm. So where would I go to know? Because you're in a different part of the country than I'm at, or mm -hmm. even a different part of the world. Uh, you know, how do I know? Like, where do I go to see what birds are in my area compared to what are in your area? And what do I, you know, what? Because I know some birds migrate. So, like, what's in my area okay. in the summer and what's not? Well, let's let's go at this a um, couple of different ways. I will talk about birds that I might see anytime, some of which will be the same as the birds you might see, and some of them will be different. One set of birds that's all bound almost everywhere are called corvids. And these are the crows, the jays, the magpies, the ravens. If you're in Europe, there's even more different kinds of corvids. But here in the U.S., we have crows. Now, the, this is the crow I would see, which is a California scrub jay. You would, in Minnesota, would see this crow called a blue jay, not a crow. What am I saying? Jay, excuse me. <laughs> so, wherever you are, there's probably a jay around of some sort. Here's the our jay, the California scrub jay, and it is very beautiful. It's sky blue. It's got a, a little necklace here. Sometimes it's complete. Sometimes it's partial beautiful bird and they plant acorns as most jays do so here it is with an acorn in its mouth and if you want to identify a jay they have attitude when they're at the top of the tree usually short trees top of the tree they're all around upright looking around it's like this is my territory we call them the cic the corvid in control um other corvids there's everybody knows a crow different kinds of crows, but this is the American crow. It's all across the country. So the crows in your area would probably be the same. There are a few other kinds of crows, like fish crows and stuff like that. But this American crow is almost everywhere. Black bird, black beak, black legs, black eyes. Hmm. And this is a raven. Now, ravens are not crows, but they're black, 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 black. It's like, Okay, what's the difference? The bill size compared to the head is one difference. The total size of the bird. So the the crow is smaller, the raven is bigger. They're both big birds. I mean, if, if you see a crow on the ground, it's a big bird. A raven, it can lean over and peck you in the knee. I mean, they're a big bird. Um, and they different they they live in different places. Some like the ravens here in California are mostly up in the hills, up in the up in the mountains. If you see them flying, that's one of the easiest ways to tell them apart. You can't tell size when they're that far up in, in the sky. You just can't tell what the size of the bird is. But if you look at the tail on the raven, it's a spade-shaped tail. It's it's longer in the middle than it is on the sides. In the crow, the tail feathers are even. So it's just a little fan of, of things. Okay. Other kinds of corvids that are many places. This is a yellow-billed magpie. Now, this is my magpie. This is a California magpie. You are not going to see that if you are on the other side of the mountains. There, you've got black-billed magpies. So people who are serious birders and they want to get all the different species that they can, they come to California to look at these at these birds. But magpies are, are common lots of places. There are also lots of birds that are called magpies that really aren't. 
But here is here is a question that I wish you would ask, and that is, what color is this bird? Well, it's black and white. Hmm, now wait a minute. That's not all just black and white. And you're right, there are two kinds of black on this bird. The head, the front where the chest is, the back, they're black, black, pigmented black. But the wings, the tail, those are an iridescent black. And so they reflect, might be reflecting green or blue or purple. It's sort of like, have you ever walked around and seen a puddle and, and somebody had changed their oil there? So there's like an oil slick. Oh, yeah. It, seen that. It, yeah. And it's those the iridescent colors, that's what we're talking about. So here is the magpie. Now, here we see the magpie with its wings spread. And you can see there that the, the wings and the tail are other colors. But the back of the head, I mean, and the rump, those are black, black. Anyway, corvids are smart birds. These are the magpies flying overhead, long tail folded up when they fly, but it's a long tail. Okay, so um, other birds that you might see commonly in, in many places. One is another bird that has that white wing patch that the magpies had. Did I mention that? I don't think I did. Notice that when they're flying, they're black and white birds, but they have these big white wing patches. On It's very, very easy to see. If you see something like that, that's eh, a magpie. Other birds that have those flashing things is... Well, it's not a magpie. Now, notice the clues on this one. It has those white patches, but it's a gray bird, not a black bird. And the tail feathers, the outer tail feathers are white. This happens to be a magpie. I mean, a mockingbird, not a magpie. And this is what it looks like when the tail's all folded up and it's sitting down someplace. Now, this is another bird with attitude, but it's a different attitude where the Scrub Jay was very vertical, sitting on the top of the tree, looking around like this. This one stands there with its tail cocked up. It goes, who's there? Who's there? What's going on? What's going on? And they are very territorial. They're not only territorial to other mockingbirds, but they'll chase the cat out of the yard. Yeah. Yeah. And they're called mockingbirds because they sing a lot. And they don't just sing their own songs. They... Uh, they pretend to be a robin, or they pretend to be a linnet, or they pretend to be whatever else, and sing those songs too. In fact, mockingbirds have been known to learn a song that wasn't really a song. So, when I used to be on the fire crew, I was in college, and and we, we everybody had a beeper. So when the beeper went off, then you had to call in and get ready and go fire fire. Well, it was summer, of course, and. And I carried the beeper around with me when I went gardening or did whatever I did. The beeper would go off. I'd call in, no problem. Mockingbird learned the song. So I'm out there in the garden one day and I hear this beeper. It's sort of, I'm going, oh, it must have left it in the house. And I look down, I got it on my waist. It's like, what? Mockingbird. Okay. So um, those are, are, are all of the kind of birds that you would see in your place uh, with, you know, probability, high probability. Okay. So, so can I ask you, why does a mockingbird mock the other birds? Why does it do that? You'll have to ask the mockingbird. Okay. I, I'm, I'm not a mockingbird. I, I don't know. If you're asking what benefit does it get from doing that, um, I think it might, uh, it might benefit from... Other birds thinking that there is one of them in the area, so they won't come in. That's my theory. But oh, okay, sort of protecting. It's you said well, it's very territorial. Maybe it's territorial even to other birds. Then perhaps. Well, yeah. I mean, so if it if it's if it's singing a robin song, then the robin from down the block is not going to come over because it says, "Oh, well, there's all already you know, Fred's already over there, so I won't do that." I don't know if that's true or not, but that's my theory. Okay, I didn't ask you to ask this question, so I'm going to ask it myself. So, are bird species all the same? In other words, in the same species, do they all look alike? Nope. Mm -mm. It doesn't work that way. 
How do you get a difference? Well, could be a male female he she difference, uh, so that he could be dressed for show and she could be dressed for nest keeping or whatever. Here we have a Western bluebird. The males are on the left and the females are on the right. And look, well, they're the same size, they're the same shape. It's just a little bit different coloration. Not a lot, but a little bit. This bird, very different coloration. This is a wood duck. Uh, males are called drakes and females are called hens, as is true for most ducks. And the males are brilliantly colored, whereas the females are shades of brown, gray, beige, you know, that sort of thing. Most of the females who have this divergent coloring are that color because they're the ones going to sit on the nest and not get noticed because they're the same color as their vegetation. Here is the mallard duck. That's probably the most common bird you've ever seen because it's all over. And uh, any any park has mallards probably, unless, unless the can Canada geese have taken over. But anyway, here we go. The, the mallard male, brightly colored. Female, brown. Now, I think that you can presume some social interactions from the color of the bird. If she is hideable, she's probably the one who's doing the housekeeping. She's probably the one sitting in the nest. She's probably the one taking care of things. And he's probably not. In that species where, people, where the birds are the same color, like the scrub jays, the crows, the shared housekeeping is, is more likely. So, Again, my theory, I don't know if it's true or not. Here's a, a bird, it's called a house finch, but it's the American version of a linnet. I did not, all the bird books say this is a house finch. But when I talked to some of the old time European farm families, they would call them linnets. And I'm going, well, okay. So obviously there were linnets in Europe and they sang prettily and they had a little bit of red on their head. So when somebody came over here, they saw a bird that sang and had red on the head that were birders. So they just called it like, yeah, makes sense. Common names can be really confusing. Turns out this is a cousin to the European linnet. So yeah, American linnet, house finch, same thing. There are other birds that have um, different coloration. And one of the most popular ones is the hummingbird. Now, here on the West Coast, we have a number of different hum hummingbirds, and Anna's hummingbird is the one that's here most. And back East, you don't usually see this one, but hummingbirds are hummingbirds. He has the, the color, and he has the, the action. He will defend the territory. He will defend that flower from any other hummingbird except his spouse and kids and other things too. They're tiny little birds and they're ferocious. So here is an Anna's hummingbird again. This is a male. And if you look at the upper left picture, the bird is facing away from you and it looks like all those feathers are black. In the middle, as it turns, you can see, wait a minute, wait a minute, there's a little, little bit of, of rosy red there. And then as it's facing you, it now shows the rosy red color. This is, again, a case of iridescence, where the reflection from the feathers depends upon the angle of light. And the hummingbirds know this. So if they're just looking around, mm, nothing. But if they see you... They will not only look directly at you, they'll flare out their gorget, and you'll get this shocking, tiny, but shocking uh, display. Females, on the other hand, mostly green and silver. Yeah. By the way, that nest is about the size of a dime. Yeah. Okay. The other hummingbird that, that I have in my yard, I have Anna's that nest here, and we have this one called a black chin hummingbird. And again, the males have some color. In this case, they have a violet purple uh, band down there on the throat. And it you don't always see it. In fact, you very seldom see it unless you're in just the right light. The females, 
are silver and green. Um, these are a little bit smaller than the annas. The annas are a little bit bigger. But these are equivalent to your uh, ruby-throated, where this bird has the purple. The ones you have in, in the east are ruby-throated, and they have the, the red there where this purple is. Same size, same shape. They're actually cousins. But, all right, so that's um, male-female difference in what things look like. But there's another way that you might see a difference. You might see it juvenile and adult. So when the babies are born, they look one way. And then after they grow up big enough to be courting and get mates, then they look another way. So this is called a white crowned sparrow. They have black and white racing stripes on the adults. Very handsome bird. And they migrate up and down hill here in California. So they're in our house at the winter, but they go up into the hills for, for breeding and things like that. I don't know if they're in your place, if they're there all the time, or if they migrate in and out of your area. I don't even know if they're in your area, but they're probably there. They're, they're widely distributed. So these are the adults. I can't tell if it's a he or she. Doesn't matter to me. The young ones, instead of black and white, they have brown and beige. And so you'll see the legs color is the same, the bill color is the same, the pattern of everything is the same, except the head color is slightly different. So here we have the adults, and in the middle is a juvenile, a young one. A related bird is the golden crown sparrow. Now, these are adults. They have two very thick black lines, and in the middle at the top, they have gold. As you go further back the head, that gold sort of fades into, into white. But these, again, um, they're related. They're quite similar to the white crown sparrows. They hang out with them. They migrate the same way that the others do. But their young ones don't have black and gold. They have beige and I don't know, yellowish. But then as the birds uh, um, grow up, so they're that, that, that brown stuff when they're juveniles, but at some point they're going to turn into adults and they'll get their adult color. So as they're molting, this one in the lower right hand corner, you can see it's got the bright yellow now that's come in and it's got, well, it's starting to get the black, but around the eyes, it still has the other colors. That's because it's molting, it's changing. And um, okay. The other color variations you might see within a species are individual. So here are some dark-eyed juncos. Now, some of them look different than others. Um, in some, the back is sort of brownish. In some, the back is the same color as the head. In some, it's, it's dark black. In some, it's uh, gray or black. It's of quite a wide variation. Some of these are what they call different races, and some of them are just, oh, this one's different than that one. But notice um, the, the one where you see the bird flaring its tail. Those tail feathers, those tail feathers are all white on, on the sides. And so as it flares its tail, it's going to be a tail with that flash of white. And that flash of white on both sides is very diagnostic. So if you've got little birds around your, around your yard, and as they fly away, you see that flash of white, it's a junco. Little bird, flash of white. Remember, big bird, gray with a flash of white, that would be the mockingbird. Different size. Okay, what else do we have? Oh, back to these guys again. These are the house benches. They like to sing. The boys sing and try and attract the girls. Notice the different colors on the two on the edges. Those are both male. Now, the males are, are the same brown and beige as the females, it's like, except like somebody took them upside down and dunked that head into, into some pigment. There's some red ink or some orange ink or some pink colored ink. Uh, and they vary. There's been studies done to see if they can figure out why one variation, maybe it attracts the ladies more than the other. It doesn't seem to work that way. They all have about the same success rate. Okay, and then the last kind of difference that I, I wanted to talk about, well, these are 
regional differences. And sometimes the birds are different enough that they're considered different species. Sometimes they're considered subspecies of the same. So here we have yellow rumped warblers. Now, this one has a form on the left, which is courting plumage. That is to say, when it has molted and it's time to go raise family, that is the time the males are trying to try and be most attractive. And so they've got the brightest plumage. And then in the winter time, when they're not wanting to be quite so showy, when they molt on that one, they get a more drab plumage. So these two yellow rumped warblers, I don't know if they're male or female. The male female difference doesn't happen. But look at the difference in color. And this is a summer winter difference. Most birds will molt twice a year. Not all of them, not all species, but most of them do. So on the left is the uh, courting, and on the right is not. These are our yellow rumped warblers, and this subspecies, which used to be a separate species, is called Audubon's warbler. And this is called Myrtle's warbler. Very similar, but the throat is white, where the throat on the other one was yellow. Again, different in plumage. The one on the right is ready for courting. The one on the left is what I see all winter long because they only visit us in the winter. I had the hardest time trying to, to remember which one was which. Now, I knew one was white and one was yellow. How could I remember that? Well, a yellow, which is like that, if I turn it upside down, it looks like an A. Hey, that worked. Audubon's have a yellow throat. If I go Myrtle's, when I turn it upside down, it's like a W, and myrtles have a white throat. So there's a lot of ways to remember some of this stuff, because some of it's a little, well, yeah, takes a little, little takes a little doing. Okay, Whew, that was a long one. <laughs> what do you want to ask me, ask me next? Well, I'm, I'm actually curious that I was wondering how the, the birds change color. So they're actually losing their feathers then. And getting a whole new set of feathers once yes. it's time for mating season comes along. It's called molting, M-O-L-T-I-N-G, molting. And if you go to the Cornell University, there's some lovely articles on molting and why birds molt, when it happens. Different species do it differently. I mean, if you are a bird that has um, a tail feather that's huge, growing that tail feather that's going to be a lot of work, a lot of energy. If you're a little tiny bird and you only have little tiny feathers, then not so much, not so much to replace. So they don't just drop all their feathers and be stark naked, even though that cartoon is a funny cartoon. Um, they actually have a pattern in which they drop a feather. So I can't remember how they do tail feathers. I think it's from the outside in but it might be from the inside out. Anyway, two of them will drop. And as those are growing out, they're using the others. Once those grow out, then two more will drop. And once those grow out, and it works like that. So not all birds lose all their feathers twice a year. And my guess is that the bigger the tail is, the less likely that is to happen. Okay, anyway, molting. Who knew? Well, you did. I didn't. <laughs> Well, yeah, but that's why you get to answer the question. Yeah, that's why I'm the novice birder of the group here. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about um, identifying birds. And I've got a pair of birds here that are going to be difficult. So let me switch that over. Okay. This is called a hermit thrush. Now, these are birds that come to my yard in the wintertime. We have a lot of birds that do that. They come either downhill or from the north, and they land here and they go, oh, Davis, that's going to be a great place to hang out for the winter. And then they're here. And we have um, this little bird. It's called a hermit thrush. It is smaller than a robin, bigger than a sparrow. Oh, you noticed when I was trying to identify something, I, I relate it to other birds that are common. So most everybody knows how big a house sparrow is. So if I say bigger than a sparrow, that gives you a clue. 
if I say smaller than a robin, robins exist all over the country. So that's another good one for a clue. So this is somewhere in between. It is brown on the back, creamy on the front with speckles starting at the at the chin and going partly down. Diagnostic is the tail and the rump. The rump is the part of the back where the tail attaches are this lovely rufous color. It's sort of a rusty orangey brown. So there you go. Now, this bird comes, I usually see one at a time. One year we had a pair, but that's okay. You, you know, you see it solitary. It's called a hermit thrush. That would make sense to be solitary. And then it hops around in the ground and it eats stuff. And okay, there you go. So I've ID'd a bird, hermit thrush. <laughs> that's wonderful. Until I go and I look at this one. Now here we have a bird. It's brown on the back. And it has those brown speckles going down into a creamy belly. And its tail is rufous. And the rump is usually rufous. You'll notice one of these is a little bit grayer and one is a little browner. There is some variation in, in this. And it hops around in the ground. And it is a fox sparrow. What? Okay, wait a minute. They're here. At the same time, they're in the same location in my yard, in the leaves on the ground. They're the coloration to describe them sounds the same. How am I going to tell these two apart? And here's where we come to one of the keys when you're trying to figure out what a bird is like. Look at the beak. If you look at the beak on the left, that's that fox sparrow. It's thicker. It's sort of conical. It's um, it looks like it would be strong enough to break a seed. Yeah. Look at the beak on the right. Now, this is a thinner one. This is the hermit thrush. It's more for grabbing insects and stuff and less for, you know, I don't think it would do well on a seed. So that is a big difference if you can see the bill. If you can't see the bill, well, work on it some other way. And the other way is something called doing the tohi shuffle. Now, I have... <laughs> I am embarrassed to say I have links to videos, but I don't know how to play them. So we're just going to have to have you imagine them. So the tohi shuffle. If a bird is, it, it lands like this. These are its feet. It's land down. It grabs and throws the, the dirt and lands down and sees what's underneath. So maybe it's a bug. Maybe it's a, a some, I don't know, seeds or something. Something down there. And that is the tohi shuffle. Now, fox sparrows do it. Tohis do it. Uh, there's California brown tohi. There's the spotted tohi. Used to be called rufous-sided tohi. There's the eastern tohi that get, you get up your way. And they all do the same thing. They land on the ground, grab things with their feet, fling them and look and see what they can find. I don't have those videos, but I will tell you how to get them so you can go look for yourself. But first, let me introduce you to the tohis. These are this top one is now called the California tohi. It used to be called a brown tohi. And uniform brown color, very, you know, very bland. Got a little bit of that rusty color on its ventral area. You know where the rump is on the back where the tail has the opposite side where the tail is under the and then the spotted toey, which used to be called rufous sided, which makes sense because the sides are are red. They're that red color like Robin Redbreast. And that is now called spotted toey out here. Okay. So those, if you wanted to see, um, if you wanted to see those videos, let me tell you how to get there. And I don't think I have, hmm. Have you got a um have you got a way to show a screen like a browser window or something, TJ? I might have that ability. Um, well, you, well, I'll talk a little a bit and maybe can you can go to um what we're gonna go to is called Macaulay Library, M-A-C A-U-L-E-Y library and this is from Cornell University and this is a place where people when they record their what birds they've seen on a birding tour that they did on a trip they did they can also submit photos if they want to and so there are now 
thousands of thousands of photos of all these different birds from all over the world. And it's just, it's so amazing. So if he can find Macaulay Library and put that up on his screen, I will walk you through it. Okay. So someplace in there, there's a place where you can type a name. You got that? A little type box? Yeah, species type in, name. Tohi, T-O-W-H-E-E, Tohi. All right. Now, what it's going to show you is it's going to show you, okay, I'm not sure you're in the, in the same place as I, as I would expect to be, but if you are in the same place, then at the top on the left-hand side, it's going to say how many pictures, how many sound recordings, and how many videos there are for this bird. And when you put in a bird, when you put in tohi, it'll usually come up with a choice of tohi. So you can go Eastern tohi, spotted tohi, brown tohi, whatever. And once you've done that, then it will show you just those birds. And then you can make more selection. You can say, I just want to see the videos, just those birds. And then as you, oh, he's got a video coming up. Okay. So I'm not sure this is the right one. Can you see it grabbing and, and flinging? Nope. It just looked like it's pecking into the grass here. Okay. So I, I went through and I looked and I found some that did that and so if you go back out to the to the main thing and then you know you look around for it so i found videos i i can prove they do it and you can prove they do it you can just go there macaulay library and you'll be able to look things up okay that is not going to have it that's that's not going to do the tohi shuffle that's not tohi <laughs> all right all right, let's talk about, so you ask me where we might see birds, right? Yeah, so, you know, where do I go if I, you know, I'm a novice uh -huh. birder, where, you know, <laughs> other than going and looking at my backyard, yeah. where should okay. I go? So when you're out and about, you take your binoculars with you, go for a walk, go to a park, Go to a nature preserve, wherever there is. I mean, it can it could be your backyard, but there's more birds available in, in a setting that has the fewer humans. So here we have a thought. What kind of birds might I see if I were looking in trees? Birds in trees. Okay. So there's a in the distance, little tiny thing. Well, that's too small. Those are called bush tits. This is what you look like. They look like if you get close up. Now, the males, the one on the left has a yellow eye, so you know it's a male. And the one on the right has a dark eye, so you know it's a female. The ones on the bottom, I, I think, are all young ones. I, I, think, <laughs> I think that's what, yeah. They hang out in little flocks. And when you, you hear this little, very tiny little high twittery things. Look around and you'll see a little cloud of bush tits going from tree to tree to tree to tree. Now they're not harvesting berries or bug, I mean, um, things like that. They're not going after the fruit. Look at that beak, little tiny, tiny, tiny thing. They are insect eaters. And so they're going to go out and they're going to go to the tree and they're going to clean off whatever whatever they, they can find. They are very, 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 very cute. They have very long tails compared to their body. They are so lightweight that it's like they're anti-gravity birds. They, they don't care. They'll hang upside down on things. I once saw a flock of bush tits taking baths on the leaf of a bush. I mean, the, the, the leaf was, you know, like this size and the, the little bird was this size and the, we had had a sprinkler going so the leaves were wet. So they went in and they were doing a little fluffy stuff, just taking a bath. So cute. They make amazing nests. And I think if you can see that picture again, there is a nest in there that in the middle. It's long. It's it's it hangs down. It's um you could probably get 20 bush tits in there. And I think they do. I think they're communal nesters. I know one day we were going for a walk. The naturalist knew where this was and pointed it out to us. And even pointing it out, 
It was so difficult to, to find it because it's so blended so well. But you could see it moving and having everything going. And she said, and that's all the little birds inside moving around. Anyway, bush tits, things you might see in a tree. Um, and then we can get from the very small to the very large. Now, in California, flickers are only here in the winter. And we have red shafted flickers. Back east, I believe you have yellow shafted flickers. And I don't know. I don't think they hang around all winter, but I don't know. Do you know in, in Minnesota if you have these flickers? I don't. Uh, it doesn't look familiar like any bird okay. I've ever noticed. Okay, well, they are a kind of woodpecker, and they're uh, unusual in that they don't just eat the bugs on the trees like most woodpeckers. They also are on the ground, and so they're built differently. The structure is different on flickers than all the other woodpeckers, but they're beautiful birds. The males have a little mallar strip. It goes from the from the beak back, and they call it a whisker, but it's not really. And they are... Um, the females don't have that, and here are some of them. Now, if you notice, the under the tail is red, under the wings is red. But the reason it's called red shafted is the color of the central shaft of each feather. Complicated, huh? Beautiful, beautiful birds. Okay, the other uh, woodpecker that we have common here in my town is the Nettles woodpecker. This is the one that has that on-off switch on its on its wings, you know. So the males have a little tiny bit of red, the females don't, but it's not a distinction that um it doesn't it doesn't socially they aren't they aren't distinct. They they both feed the nest, but they both you know, take care of the young. So they're they're sharing parenting on that. The other thing you might see in trees are things called cedar waxwings. There's also um, back east. There's a second kind called bohemian waxwings. Looks very similar. And when when you will see them, there'll be huge flocks up in the trees. In this case, it was winter time. They were sitting in a bare tree. That's my picture. And so I was actually able to get to see them. Usually, if the trees have leaves on them, you can hear them real high, squeaky, squealy kinds of things. So high pitched, in fact, that I don't notice. But people, other people go, what's that sound? And I go, oh, we better start looking for wax wings. If they can hear it and I can't hear it, likely wax wings. Anyway, the one in the picture in the middle there is you can see the back, you can see on the, the wing, it has these little red things. They look like little red sealing wax bits uh, and actually lumps, but they wear off. And so it's they're so far away, you, you can't really tell what it is. And then the tip of the tail is yellow. I believe the bohemian wax means the tip of the tail is white. Notice the crest. The one in the middle has its crest down which is the way most of the time you'll see them. But it does have a crest, and it can raise it. So the one on the right has the crest raised. Okay, so those are cedar waxwings. Other things that you might, other places you might see them is eating berries. We have toyon bushes here, and they really like those. Pyracantha, all sorts of things. And robins also are uh, toyon berry eaters. Okay, let's... You got another question for me? I don't have another question for you, Lois, but I think I may have found what we're looking for. You tell me if this is the bird doing the dance you're expecting it here. Yep. See how it's flinging the stuff with its feet? Yes. That is definitely a tohi shuffle. Very good. And Thank that you, is on, TJ. That is on the... Uh, that um, library. Mm -hmm. I just had to dig a little farther. I actually had to put in the California tohi to mm -hmm. get that particular uh, video to come up there. Mm -hmm. Well, people put in these pictures um, so you never know what's going to be there. It's not like it's a scientific thing or it's or, or anybody is going, well, no, we have to get a picture of this. No, it's just what people happen to see and happen to put in. So, okay. Um, I think I want to talk to you about 
the difference between resident birds and migratory birds. So a lot of the things that I said, they visit us in the winter, the flickers and the white crown sparrows and things. But then you have resident birds that are there all year round. And that's where it's going to be the biggest difference between where you live and where I live. Because your residence, whoops, wrong one. Your resident birds and mine might not be the same. My guess is that you have morning doves. Most of the places in the U.S. have morning doves. And these are, this is morning doves. The male and female look the same, or at least as far as I can tell. Now, there may be slight subtle differences, but I can't tell. And look at it in flight. The center tail feathers are longer than the side tail feathers. And on the side ones, there's those little white tips. It's a morning dove. That is the normal dove here in North America. There's an invader dove that was brought over, and this is called a Eurasian collared dove. I just call it a Euro dove. And if you, if you, the only time you're actually going to see the collared part is if you see the back. And on the flying bird, you can see there's a, a little black stripe back there. That's the collar of the collared dove. But also look at the tail. The tail is even. It's just a fan. There's no, it isn't long. And it isn't as sharply delineated between the white tips on the edge and the other. So the Eurasian collared dove, if you can't tell them apart, they are they are lighter color. They are grayer beige. They have a squarer tail. Uh, that's how you tell them apart. Now, on, on the, I'm going to go back to the other one. On many of them, and you'll see it on the flying one, right there on the side of the neck, there's a, a black dot. It isn't always very noticeable, but it, it does exist and it doesn't exist on the other one. Here's the comparison of the two together. They both have pink feet. Right? They both have the same color bill. And they inhabit the same niche in the in the nature, nature niche. And so the Eurasian color dove is forcing out the native uh, morning doves in some places. Okay, another bird that I hope you have, you may or may not have, is the black Phoebe. Now, the black Phoebe, I expect to see it like this with... It's, a, it's sitting on a twig in the middle of a creek or a marsh or someplace wet, and it's going from that tree, flying out and grabbing an insect and flying back. And they're, they're definitely uh, flycatchers, beautiful birds. But in the last 15 years, they have just come into town. So uh, in our area, we don't the city doesn't spray poisons anymore. And so there are lots of little tiny insects on the on the grassy playgrounds and things like that. And so the black babies have moved in and went, oh, lunch. And so I see these all the time. The other day I looked out and oh, there was one in my yard just perched on the on the antenna of my car. And I'm going, yes, we've got our baby. So uh, there are other other flycatchers around, but uh, this is the this is one of the more common ones here. And you probably have something, some Phoebe back there, Eastern Phoebe. I don't know. And then they have lots of cousins that are peewees and that sort of stuff. So flycatchers are an are an interesting group. The other thing that is very common, uh, these are little tiny birds. They're, they're not quite as small as a hummingbird, but they're getting close. Little tiny things. This is called a ruby-crowned kinglet. We also have a golden-crowned kinglet out here. And these little birds, well, ruby means red, right? Crowned would be on the top of your head. You see any red in the top of the end of these heads? Mm -mm. Well, first of all, only the boys have it. The girls don't have it. And then only when they're really excited. So either they're they're courting or making out, or they're upset, or they're excited for some reason. So here are ruby crown kinglets. I have never, ever in my entire life seen that one in the upper left, upper right, with the no, I've never seen it. I had to look through hundreds, if not thousands of pictures in that Ruby Crown Kinglet collection over on, on the uh, Macaulay Library to find one that was this excitable. Anyway, 
they're ruby crown kinglets. So they're nice little birds. And they, they eat a lot of aphids and things like that. And then there's a real common, common, common bird. It's the size of a sparrow. <laughs> and everybody knows what a sparrow looks like because we have house sparrows everywhere. I, I won't go into the history of them now, but it, it's really fascinating. They were transported all over the world by people and not as cage birds either. Oh, you really want to know? Okay. I'll take it out. Uh, sailing ships. The sailing ships, they'd have to, to keep, to, to take grain so that they'd have food when they went off sailing. And these little birds would get into the, into the cargo areas of the sailing ships. That's how they got. And the reason we know that they're all the same um, lineage is that they've done, they've done um, genetic research. They've done, you know, blood tests and, and they all came from the same place. It's just pretty amazing. Okay, other birds that you might see anywhere in the country? What? Turkeys. <sighs> yeah, wild turkeys almost went away, but then they came back. And so there are now turkeys lots and lots and lots and lots of places. And these are wild turkeys. I mean, the, the big picture with the white border that I took that one and the little one with the tombstones, that's in our cemetery here in Davis. So we now have turkey flocks that are becoming a nuisance that there's so many of them all right well that's those are the kinds of things that you might see around so let me hi hi wait a minute i've got two cameras all right so what do you think tj well i'm curious um one of the birds that I know lives in the northern climates year round, mm -hmm. and which is kind of amazing to me is a black cap chickadee. Chickadees, it's a, yeah. It's a tiny, tiny little bird, and it just amazes me that the thing doesn't freeze solid in the winter because it gets to 20 plus below degrees Fahrenheit well, here. Yes. And, but if and, you think, think about this, you put on a down jacket to keep warm, don't you? I don't do. You? Yeah. I do. Uh -huh. And and that the, the amount of down for the amount of human, I mean, the down is only a couple inches thick, and you're much thicker than that. So, you know, that's not a lot of protection for that giant human. But think about one of those little tiny chickadees. They're almost all fluff. <laughs> They're almost all down. And what they do is they... Um, fluff up their feathers, trap air, which is the insulation, and that's how they keep from freezing. Yeah. That's amazing. I still, every time I see them in the winter, I'm like, man, how do you guys just not freeze solid? It is amazing. And they're flying around and, yeah. uh, you know, it's, and it's they, just And wild. they do have to eat, and, and, and not all of them will make it through the winter. But as long as they've got enough food and they can, they can keep moving, they'll generate heat and you know, and if they're going to sit down, they're going to huddle down on top of their feet so their their feet stay warm with their fluffy feathers. And uh, my husband told me that they have a, a heat exchange where the blood coming from from there down to the feet and back um, it is in such a way that it it helps keep the the feet from freezing. So, well, anyway, I think that's about our time for tonight. And uh, I certainly had a good time showing you stuff. And TJ, if you got more questions, go ahead and ask me. We've got a couple of minutes, but not long. So I, I have a question for you, Lois. Um, and thank you for the show, because I've actually learned an amazing amount over the shows that I've been able to watch or be part of, um, especially like the binocular episode. I learned so much about uh, just using a pair of binoculars effectively. That was mm -hmm. great. Um, question I have for you is, why do you do this? You know, what, 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 what drives you to have this show? You know, because I know it's a lot of work for you. Why, why do you do it? You know, that's a hard one to answer. Um, partly I do it because I love teaching. I love sharing knowledge with people. Uh, I've had a radio show for a long time. And before that, I had a television show here in town. And it was always... 
find something out and then share it. And so I would interview people and or I'd get somebody on who was doing real jargony stuff and I'd translate from jargon into normal English speech or things like that. So I like that part. Um, so for years, I did a, a slideshow for the Arboretum here. I'm a docent at the Arboretum at UC Davis. And, and so I did this little birding slideshow and, and had a good time. And then last December, I, I asked the folks in after hours, which is the office hours behind the scenes thing, um, how I could up my game for this slideshow that I was doing. And, you know, I was just doing an annual slideshow. And boy, they got excited. And next thing I knew, we were doing, we were planning to do a weekly uh, show, which would be, you know, nine panelists and and live questions. And, and you know, it's just sort of like office hours, but for birds instead of for technology. And then, uh, but, you know, it, your panelists have to have a little more prep time. So we said, okay, we'll ask the questions ahead of time. So we, we got a place where people could send in questions. And, um, and things have morphed. And now it is much less stressful for me because I'm not trying to do every week. And I'm not trying to coordinate nine panelists, which is sort of like herding cats. You know, it's really a tough thing to do. Instead, I'm getting a, a speaker. And so we had Kurt, Curtis Dykstra came, and he's a naturalist uh, from, from Michigan. He works in their parks. And he came in and did a presentation, and it was so much fun. So what I'm doing is I'm taking my radio show experience, and I'm just transitioning to do video instead of radio. And I, I may take what we've done tonight, I may take that and extract a radio show out of it. Who knows? We don't know. But anyway, as long as I'm enjoying myself, I will keep doing it. And I am not the bird lady by any means. Um, TJ says he's a perpetual novice. So am I. I'm just a little bit further along than he is. So Lois, is there a place where we could go to maybe ask a question or find out a little bit more? Absolutely. We have now gotten, well, everything's branded. And we have now gotten birdingwithlois.global. And that's the website. You can go there, you can see the archives, you can see all of the shows, all of the, the funny little things that aren't full-time Birding with Lois shows. You can ask a question. You can sign up to be a panelist. You can sign up to be on the crew. Everything's there. So birdingwithlois.global. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for, for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you to TJ and JJ and Alan. I think there's a couple more people in the back room that I don't Taylor's know who's back there. there too, I know. Good, good, yeah. One of the things that I, I like about this show is that everything's volunteer, but the crew gets to practice with our show in order to hone their skills for doing, well, more professional things. Because, you know, I'm pretty laid back. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. That's enough for tonight. And we'll see you next time. Anything last words, TJ? Nope. Thank you. I've learned a lot again, as okay. always. As always. Okay. Well, bye-bye.